All right, students, I got a special hat on just for this chapter. Ride with Jesus. Choo choo! <laughs> All right. Chapter 13 Were We Never to Reach China? Hudson Taylor. Page 161. Page 161, Rosine tells me. Were We Never to Reach China? It was May 25th, 1866. The following day, the first official group of missionaries from the China Inland Mission would set sail aboard the Lumur bound for Shanghai. Hudson put his pen down and smiled. He had just completed writing a passenger list to give Captain Bell the next day. Oh, by the way, I came really close to almost crying that last chapter. Just so excited to see how God had provided for Hudson and his team. Did you know that um, earlier my turtle was lost? But we found her under the tomatoes. We have a praise report to share in class. He looked at the list. His name was at the top, along with Maria's and their four children. Six-year-old Grace, five-year-old Herbert, three-year-old Howard, and little Samuel, nearly Herbert two years Howard. old. He hoped Samuel wouldn't be cutting any teeth. That means like teething. Um, while they were at sea. He still had vivid memories of the journey home, sitting through the night with the teething Grace. Well, they should have used clove oil, if you ask me. That works wonders on any teething baby or chamomile. I don't think All right. essential oils existed. They probably did, but something Listed below the children were the names of the only other married couple in the group, Lewis and Eliza Nicole. Lewis was a blacksmith from Scotland. Below them were the names of five single men, James Williamson, George Duncan, Josiah Jackson, John Sell, and William Rudlin. Following them were the names of the single women. Jane McLean, Emily Blatchley, Jenny Falding, Mary Bowsum, Mary Bell, Louise Desgrasse, Elizabeth Rose, Mary Bauer, and Susan Barnes. I wonder how many couples are going to get married by the time they get to China on that long sea ride, huh? <laughs> Hudson prayed for each name on the list and asked God to give each person strength for their journey. He thought about each one. He remembered how they had to come to him with their eyes shining and their faith strong. He told each one plainly about the potential dangers that lay ahead. And each one had looked him straight in the eye <laughs> and told him he was called by God to take the gospel to Inland China. I'm called by God to take the gospel to Inland China. What? Ever the cost. The men and women made a good team. Most of them were not scholars. They were secretaries, stonemasons, carpenters, and teachers. But they had an enthusiasm to share God's love with people. Any other skill or knowledge they needed, Hudson was sure they could learn later. Most importantly, they had a love for God and praying heart. And that was the core of missionary with the China Inland Mission. Hudson also prayed for their departure. He knew how difficult it was to say goodbye, especially for the parents and family staying behind. There was a cost to count, and some of those saying, goodbye tomorrow would never see each other again this side of heaven. And while he would do everything, he could, be, he could to make sure those in his party were safe, both on the voyage and when they got to China, each one felt he was called to go. So the real responsibility for his safety and well-being rested with God. When I was in Thailand for six months, I did not talk to my mom the whole entire time I was there. The phone call was way too expensive, but we did write letters. Mm. And letters I think there was email. When he'd finished praying, Hudson went downstairs. The house was in an uproar. There were people and baggage and noise filling every room. The children were running in and out among the sea chests. Jenny Falding was showing her parents the map of China and pointing out where they would be staying at first and where they hoped to eventually go. George Duncan and James Williamson were unscrewing the legs from the harmonium and packing it into a crate. It would be one of the first things to be unpacked once they were aboard the La, La Murmur. The farewell the next day went smoothly. Of course, there were many tears as people embraced friends and family. Amelia and Benjamin, Louisa and Mrs. Taylor were all there to say goodbye. Mr. Berger and his wife also came to wish them well. As the La Murmur 
prepared to leave the East India Company dock in London. Those standing on the dock sang a hymn for those departing and then those departing sang a hymn back in reply as Maria accompanied them on the harmonium. I think it's like a piano or like a harpsichord. A steam tug maneuvered the lame remure out into uh, the main channel of the river, Thames. They all sang louder as the ship moved away from the dock. On the board, the lame remures, I wish I knew how to say that correctly. Is it like French? The lame remures. 34 men crew were, was worried. All their passengers were missionaries. And for the next four months, they would all be stuck together in the middle of the ocean. And probably every day they would have to listen to the hymn singing like the kind they had just witnessed. A long voyage always got boring and a lively group of passengers could help pass the time quickly. But 18 Bible carrying hymn singing missionaries and four children were not exactly what they had in mind. Several crew members were complaining to Captain Bell about their passengers before the Lamoureux had ever reached Gravesend. At the mouth of the River Thames, the captain just smiled as he listened to their grumbling. He, for one, was looking forward to spending time with Hudson and his group. The whole group stayed on deck until the coastline of England had faded from view. Maria and Emily Blatchley busily tried to supervise the children. Hudson could see that the boys were going to be a handful. The ship was small, and the boys needed to keep out of the way of the crew. There was also many dangerous things on board they could get caught in, such as pulleys and winches and ropes and chains, not to mention the danger of falling overboard. As the La Mermure headed for the English Channel, Hudson stood on the poop deck, and committed the voyage to God. He was grateful that across the British Isle, pockets of people were praying for them. It was true. Many Christians had criticized the China Inland Mission and its ideas of trusting God alone. But as long as there were people committed to pray for them, Hudson was confident all would be well. When people questioned how he could lead a group that included nine single women into the heart of the heat heathen country without financial support his answer was always the same i am taking my children with me and i notice it's not difficult for me to remember that they need breakfast in the morning lunch at midday and dinner before they go to bed i find it impossible to believe that our heavenly father is less tender or mindful than i am way to go hudson excuse me dr taylor but where should i put the spare rollers for the press the hold is full it was James Williamson, and his question brought Hudson back to the present. There were still things that needed to be stowed away for the voyage. England was going gone from the view now. It was time to focus on matters at hand. By Tuesday, everything was in order, and life settled into a routine. Hudson taught a Chinese language class every morning, and for a change of voice, Maria taught the class in the afternoon. There was plenty of time in the late afternoon and early evening for other things. Everyone wrote letters, hoping a ship headed for England might come alongside and take them back. Otherwise, the letters would be mailed when they reached Shanghai. Captain Bell had been right about the crew. They were rough and loud. The children had to be instructed to ignore their cursing. But as tough as the crew seemed, for the next four months, they were to be the mission field of the fledgling China Inland Mission. Mary Bell began holding a nightly Bible study, and to her surprise, many of the sailors attended it. They came not so much because they were interested in what she had to say, but because she was pretty. Louise Desgrass held Bible readings in Swedish for four crew members from Sweden. Susan Barnes held classes for those who wanted to improve their reading, and a number of the crew, a number of the crew began attending. Hudson was delighted that he didn't have to remind anyone in the group of his or her obligation to read out to the crew with gospel message. Before they left England, he'd stressed to them that a voyage across the ocean will not make anyone a soul winner. But this, he meant that a desire to share God's love with everyone had to be in their hearts whenever they found themselves, or wherever they found themselves. Simply being given the title of missionary would not magically make them missionaries. Poof. 
The group also found practical ways to help around the ship. As on the Dumfries, Hudson served at the, as the ship's doctor. He gave lectures on first aid, the circulation of the blood, and the construction of the eye. Subjects that sailors would not have found very exciting on land, but in the middle of the ocean, they drew quite a crowd. Louis Nicole forged parts for the crane hooks, while James Williamson and William Rudlin tinkered with the bilge pumps until they worked perfectly. Slowly but surely, the missionaries began to win the begrudging respect of the crew. The crew no longer complained about the hymn singing. In fact, they had heard some of the hymns so many times that they found themselves singing along without even realizing it. Then one or two of the crew began to have things to do around the ship's saloon when the group was holding their meetings. They would splice rope or check a deck joint nearby. After a couple of weeks, they did not bother with excuses. They just pulled up a barrel outside the saloon and sat down and listened. First one, then two, three, four, and more crewmen asked Jesus Christ into their lives and became Christians. Before the voyage was even half over, 23 crew members had become Christians. The young missionaries eagerly discipled the new converts. The crew asked Hudson to move his daily meeting out on deck because the saloon was becoming too cramped. But the more the crew found peace with God, the less peace they found with the first mate, Mr. Brunton. He was second in command aboard the Le Mermure, and he didn't like what was happening with his crew. Mr. Brunton had bad temper, which, unfortunately for all on board, seemed to be touched off by any mention of religion. Excuse me, my nose itches. As time went by, he became increasingly angry and began bullying many of the new converts on his crew. Converts on his crew. Mr. Brunton soon became the focus of prayer for many people on board, both passengers and crew. I call that a prayer hit list. Um, do you have anyone to put on your prayer hit list? Um, I put Mustafa, my husband, on a prayer hit list. He didn't even know it. But I wasn't planning on marrying him. I just knew he needed Jesus, so I started praying for him. And then he found God. And slowly he began to soften. He began to allow Hudson to read passages from the Bible to him and explain their meaning. One night in August, Hudson read him the Passover story from the book of Exodus. When he came to passage where God tells the Israelites to paint blood on the doorposts so death would pass over their house, Mr. Brunton jumped to his feet yelling, when I see the blood, it will pass over you. I see, I see how blind I've been. Hudson was so excited, he woke up John Sell and Elizabeth Rose, who had been praying hard for Mr. Brunton and told them the good news of his conversion. John Sell looked at his pocket watch. It was 3.30 in the morning. The next day, Mr. Brunton called the entire crew together and apologized to them for the way he'd been behaving. An amazing change took place in his life. From then on, he was at every meeting, singing as loud as he could, and he was usually the last to leave. See what happens when you put someone on your prayer hit list? They find Jesus. Hey, you remember these things? Little... Mm. Um, okay. Where was I? So he apologized. Okay. Hudson was excited at the influence of his group, was having on the crew. He wrote a letter to Mr. Berger and said, Our minds are kept in peace. As to the future, were we never to reach China, we should all rejoice <laughs> in the work God has done on the ship. I'm not even going to try to say that name again wrong. When Hudson wrote the words, Were we never to reach China, he had no idea of the test that had laid ahead for them all. It was September 10. <gasps> September 10? We just passed September 10. That's kind Let's, of exciting. Yesterday was September Six 11. more days and they would be in Shanghai. The crew was busy scrubbing the decks and painting the bulwarks, the railing in the ship of the side of the ship above the deck, and preparing for their arrival. Hudson had rigged up a system so that the missionaries could pull buckets of seawater in through the portholes in their cabins and take a bath in the tin bathtub. They were eating, or they were each taking turns at having a bath, and Susan Barnes was giving everyone a haircut so they would look well-groomed on arrival. Emily Blatchley and Maria were busy patching the holes the young tailor boys had worn in their pants, crawling around the ship. 
Everyone was looking forward to their first glimpse of China, but things weren't right. The weather was beginning to get squally and the barometric pressure was falling. Um, barometric uh, usually measures the pressure in the air to tell if it's going to rain or not or how much rain. Um, or if the pressure changes, then you know it's going to rain. So Captain Bell didn't say much about it at first. He hoped they were only heading into a light storm. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. The ship was directly in the path of a typhoon. Dun, dun, dun. Captain Bell finally ordered everything on deck to be lashed down with ropes and the sails to be pulled down and stowed so they wouldn't be torn to shreds by the wind. Okay. Having been through the nightmare of the storm on the Dumfries, Hudson calmed the fears of those in the party and helped them tie themselves into their bunks. For, the first, for two nights, the, la the ship was tossed about mercilessly by the sea. Huge waves rolled across the decks and spilled water into the saloon. Then, as quickly as it had come, the storm left. Everyone came up on deck to survey the damage. From the look of things, it was just as well the storm had ended when it did. The Lamoureux couldn't have stood much more of the sea's pounding. The lifeboats had been washed away, and so had the pens where the animals were kept, along with the last few remaining animals. The ship was in need of repairs, but with calm seas and better weather, she would easily make it to her destination. <laughs> You're sitting in a phrase. You just distracted me. I was busy reading. <laughs> the next three days were spent drying out the sails, pumping the bilge, and tightening the rigging, several barrels of food supplies had been soaked with salt water and rain and were useless. So meals were meager. But being only a few days from Shanghai, no one was too worried. There would be plenty to eat when they reached the city. Hudson was also glad they would be in Shanghai soon. But for whatever reason, Captain Bell had become ill. Hudson wasn't quite sure what the problem was, but the left half of Captain's face was paralyzed. An exact diagnosis of problem required more medical equipment than was on board the ship. The sooner they got to Shanghai, the better. That night, the barometric pressure began to drop again and faster than it had before the previous storm. The crew and the passengers held, on ur held an urgent prayer meeting. If this storm was going to be worse than the last one, only God could get them through it. The battered ship was in no condition to battle her way through another storm. By the time they had finished praying, the wind was howling across the decks, snatching up barrels of supplies as though they weighed nothing and hurling them into the ocean. One minute, the ship was pointed towards the sky. Yikes! And the next, it was skidding down the face of mountainous wave. Hour after hour, the La Murmur was slammed by enormous seas. Every time someone from the crew appeared in the saloon, he had worse news than before. The bulwarks had been washed away. Now there was nothing to stop the waves, and soon they began washing across the deck and pounded against the saloon door. Everyone longed for the storm to end. Passengers and crew were both at exhaustion level, but the storm just continued to gather strength. After two days of battling the storm with no food and no sleep, the crew were, were losing hope. Captain Bell and Mr. Brunton could no longer motivate them to work. With the bulwarks gone, there was nothing to hold on to or protect them on deck, and any or all them could be swept aboard in an instant. Even when the jib and four stay sails, the long pieces of wood that supported the bottoms of the sails broke loose, the crew would not go out on the deck Hang to on. secure them. The what? storm lasted two days. Oh, it's lasting too long. The jib and four stay sails swung about dangerously in the wind. At any moment, they could come crashing down, and if they did, they would go right through the deck, and the ship would surely sink. As Captain Bell looked across the deck of his ship, his heart sank. It was the beginning of the end. The La Murmur would not hold up to the pounding she was taking much longer. The hull seemed to creak louder with each passing hour. Still, sick as he was, he had to try to save his ship. 
Since the crew would not obey him, he and Mr. Bunton would have to do it alone. Together they climbed out onto the deck, hoping to grab the jib and four stay sails and tie them down. They crawled along low to the deck so the swinging jib would not knock them overboard. Just as they were getting ready to grab the jib, a massive wave struck the ship. The two men clung to the main mast with all their strength to avoid being washed away. Then came the cracking sound that they did not want to hear. Above their heads, the mast they were clinging to snapped, and so did the mizzen mast. As the two masts fell, they were tangled in a rigging, which stopped them from crashing right through the deck. As carefully as they could, Captain Bell and Mr. Bunton crawled to the saloon. With two of her three masts broken and lying across the deck, the ship was beginning to break up. The fallen masts battered back and forth against the deck and the side of the ship shattering whatever wood, whatever wood they hit into matched size pieces. Mm -hmm. It is only a matter of time now and not much at that. If only I could get the crew to help me, we might be able to cut the rigging away and let the mast go over the side, but it's a long shot. Captain Bell told Hudson with panic in his voice. Hudson and Maria kissed each other, kissed each one of their children goodbye and commended them to God. There was no lifeboat, and even if there were, they would be useless in these violent swells. The missionaries gathered close together in the middle of the saloon and began singing Rock of Ages. They were midway through the third verse of the hymn when Hudson noticed Captain Bell slip a pistol into his belt. Hudson crawled after him as he made his way across the deck. He caught up to him just as he neared the forecastle, where the crew had taken refuge. When they saw the captain with his revolver, they squashed themselves together further in a tiny space. They would rather be shot than forced out of their refuge. Let me talk to them, Hudson yelled over the roar of the sea. Oh yeah, he had to yell. Let me talk to them, Hudson yelled over the roar of the sea. <laughs> captain Bell nodded. And Hudson crawled into the forecastle. He raised his voice above the furry of the storm. Men, the only hope is for us to get to the masts overboard. We will help you. Our lives are in as much danger as yours. Get out and help us save the ship. From now on, I'm the background music. <laughs> the men did not move. They were as paralyzed by fear as the left side of Captain Bell's face. <laughs> Hudson gestured for Captain Bell to leave his gun in his belt. And then he crawled back to the saloon and explained the situation to the missionary men. Together they committed themselves to God and one by one crawled out to the saloon, keeping their heads down against the wind. The missionaries fanned out against the deck, holding on to the metal rings embedded in the deck. That were... Oh, boy. Sorry. That... Pow, thunder. Um, that were used for lashing down cargo. With one hand on a ring, they began to hack away at the rigging. Each man worked alone. First, they freed the mainmast and jettisoned Excuse it me, over the side. Then they, they moved towards too. the stern of the ship and set to work on the mizzenmast. I'm sure they didn't have the women on the deck because they they needed muscles. Finally, the mizzenmast fell free and was washed over. Uh, oops. Here I am. Seeing the men of China Inland Mission risking their lives to save the ship, members of the crew began to regain their courage. They crawled out from the forecastle and joined in the effort to save the ship. Finally, the mizzen mast fell free and was washed over the side of the ship, and the men made their way back to the saloon. While on deck, they had been able, unable to see each other because of the spray and water that deluged the ship. They did not know whether anyone had been washed aboard, and they waited anxiously to see who returned. One by one, the missionary men and the crew made their way into the saloon. Miraculously, not one person had been swept overboard, but the storm was not yet over. And after a quick prayer of thanks, every man and woman aboard took his or her turn manning the bilge pumps. The men and women pumped all night to keep the water that washed in Is through the holes like in the battered deck water? from sinking the ship. As morning approached, the winds began to die down. By the time the sun rose, the angry sea that had almost claimed the La Mouire was calm. Five days later, broken and maimed. That's why I chose this hat, Ride with Jesus. Oh, yeah. 
five days later, broken and maimed, the lamb murmur limped up to Huang River into Shanghai. <laughs> Curious onlookers crowded on to junks Huang to Huang. see the ship. When they saw how damaged she was, they were amazed. She made it to port. Um, is that a pencil sharpener on my Instant Pot? Yep. <laughs> all right. What a testimony to all those people to see the boat, huh? Survives such storms. Um. Hang on. Did the Dumfries sink? Oh. Did the um, Dumfries die? Okay, wait. Where am I? Oh, curious onlookers crowded onto junks to see the ship. When they saw how damaged she was, they were amazed she made it to port. The crew and passengers told the story of how they had come so close to death, only to be saved when everything else, when everything seemed hopeless. Other sailors shook their heads when they heard no lives had been lost and no one had been badly injured during the storms. Another ship, which had traveled the same course as the La Mermure, arrived in port the following day. Its shredded flag flew at half-staff. Out of the crew of 22, only six had survived the storms. Hang on, the what? other 16 crew members either had been washed aboard or were buried at sea after being killed in horrific accidents during the storms. After the Lammermoor docked, Captain Belf allowed his passengers to stay on board for a few days until they could make arrangements for somewhere to live. There had never been enough hotels in Shanghai, and Hudson knew that none of the other missionaries in the city would have enough rooms for 18 adults and four children to stay in. Not to mention space to store their printing press and printing presses and hospital equipment. The following day, the members of China Inland Mission, newly arrived in China, prayed hard that God would provide a solution to their need for accommodation. Against all odds, God had brought them this far unharmed. They knew he would not let them down now. Somewhere there was a place for them to stay and God would lead them to it. Amen. I believe so too.